Welcome to the Hockey News Anaheim Ducks end of the season mailbag. My name is Patrick Present. I'm joined by Derek Lee. We are the editors and reporters for the site. Derek, how are you doing? It's been a busy two days here. We've had uh, exit interviews, players yesterday, and uh, Greg Cronin and Pat Verbeek today. How are you feeling? Yeah, and it's it's kind of weird because I've, I've never really done this before. And um, the last, like even just last week, going to the last game of the season, obviously it was on the road. So um, it was a little bit different. And um, just being able to like, not really to say bye, but just kind of, oh, we'll see you next year. It, it, it reminded me a lot of like middle school or like elementary, yeah. right? Where you don't see some people until like the fall. And that's kind of how this whole thing was. But it, it will be interesting to see how um, this offseason kind of is just like last year where the Ducks didn't really know where they were going to be in the draft. And they didn't really know how things were going to be too with the head coach. And then now this season they had a new head coach, they had Leo Carlson, and then they'll be able to add another high caliber player to their prospect pool this summer at the Eastern draft. So um, I'm really excited to see where the team goes from here and having that first year for Greg Cronin under his belt as the head coach. Yeah. Um, it feels like this is a very different off season than last season um it's kind of like all the pieces are in place but there's some like fringe things that need to be worked out before the team is able to take the next step but it seems like that next step is a lot closer despite what the standings would tell you yeah definitely i mean i think i i honestly don't remember what they actually finished with this year but um i think it was like one or two points off from last year's total which if you look at it that way, it's like, oh, well, they didn't really make a lot of progress, but then you realize how many injuries there were and just how many things they kind of dealt with outside of that. A lot of um, penalty trouble, especially, that was what really bogged them down, and uh, it really turned the tide when it came to kind of fishing a lot of those games out and potentially having a better record than what they actually did. Yeah, but just the on ice product watching night in night out, I feel like you you visibly could see the the progress. Even though a couple of guys a couple of guys mentioned when we were doing our exit interviews um, that it was like one or two things per game that kind of destroyed them, whether it was a dumb penalty or you know a defensive breakdown or or whatnot. So it's just like, but those little things can. I know the penalties are a big thing, but those things can be cleaned up. It's not like these overarching issues that the team has and and i believe troy terry was saying that they're not too far off and and i think anyone who watches on a nightly basis can see that yeah definitely for sure all right so we asked for your questions and we got a lot of them because again this is another very pivotal season for the ducks i know for has stated multiple times it's time to now turn the corner i i like to say take the re out of rebuild and start building um no more tearing down it's time to start making strides toward contention so we've gotten a lot of questions here and we're just going to start with the first one a big one if you were gm oh this is from at strika if you were gm who would your top targets be this off season what positions need to be addressed uh well pat be kind of i mean he didn't necessarily say who his top targets specifically are but he did say he wants a top four right-handed defenseman. He wants a top six right-handed shot, so a right wing. Uh, well, I mean, right shot, left left wing or right wing, but a right-handed shot. Um, and then I think he said, he also said that he wanted to add more grit and speed to the bottom six and just kind of improving that bottom six. Um, so, I mean, the two guys that we've talked about previously at, during the trade deadline mailbag was Matt Roy and uh, Brett Pesci from the LA Kings and the Carolina Hurricanes, respectively, both right-handed defensemen, both guys that are pretty defensively sound. They can kill penalties. They're really good at killing plays. I know is a term that you like to use a lot. So those, I think those would be two priorities for me in terms of right-handed defensemen, especially two guys that can be dependable, especially in the playoffs, because these guys are both on playoff teams. They've both been on playoff teams for a while too. So you add, one of those guys behind or even in front of Radko Gudis, those are two solid right-handed options on your boob line. And then for the forwards, you, you can go a lot of different ways. I mean, a lot of guys have talked about Sam Reinhart. 
Um, I don't, I don't really think that's an option. I think that Florida is going to do everything they can to try and keep him and make sure that Alex Barkov and him are two of their key guys going forward. Um, there's guys like Jonathan Marsh or so from Vegas Golden Knights. Steven Stamkos has been the one that I've seen a lot of people toss around, especially because he's somebody that Pat Verbeek is familiar with. He, ju he just signed Alex Cloran from Tampa Bay Lightning last season and uh, Steven Stamkos is a guy that fits a lot of the needs. He's also a veteran leader, and he's somebody that potentially a lot of the young guys in the Ducks locker room could look up to. Um, and then there's also behind Roy and Pesci, I think there's guys like Anthony, or Alexander Carrier and Jalen Chatfield and Sean Walker. Those are maybe not quite as big names as Pesci and um, Roy are, but they can potentially be solid top four options as well. Yeah, and then I'd like to throw in maybe as a cheaper stopgap, Chris Tanev, and mm -hmm. also Dylan DeMello. I think um, I think he's UFA too, but I think he's had a really good year in a very structured Winnipeg Jets uh, system. And I think um, just the way again, like like we like to say, he he kills plays and and it's like a quick first pass out of the zone kind of player. Um, and then as far as the forwards go, it's harder because, yeah, there's the the cream of the crop, the Stamkos, which I, uh, there was an athletic article that said Kalorn would, was going to recruit Stamkos because the Ducks had so much cap space. And if the <laughs> Lightning would let him go, you know, he'd be, he'd yeah. be the first one to knock <laughs> on his door. Um, well, that, I mean, the, other than the guys you mentioned, uh, maybe Elias Lindholm could be like a depth center wing i don't know but um i think that'd be an interesting idea but that's going to be a very expensive um a very expensive avenue there's also um and i verbeek had said that the easiest way to acquire these kind of players is through ufa which is obvious you don't have to give up any assets yep. you don't have to go through any negotiations as far as like, like um players going uh, the other way but there are a, a lot of interesting names that could be available uh, via trade. Um, players like for on defense, um, I believe it's Connor Murphy in Chicago, right-handed defenseman. He's got a 10-team no move, so maybe that's off the table. But because um, Anaheim's likely not or likely on his no trade list, but. Um, I, I've always highlighted a guy like Braden Schneider in New York because mm -hmm. he's on that third pair behind on the right side behind um Adam Fox and Jacob Truba. So and he's been such a solid presence back there on that third line. He might require a, an increased role or demand a um demand a higher price tag if he were to, you know, get into RFA negotiations. So they could be looking to move on from him. I doubt it because he's a good young player. Uh, Justin Barron is a, a player in Montreal, kind of the same situation. So there's a lot of options um, as far as that goes. And um, forwards, I want to, for as far as trade targets, maybe um, someone like, uh, is, I believe, Josh Doan or Nick Schmaltz, maybe they're not too thrilled going to Utah and may want a change of a change of a change of a scenery. Um, or guys, guys that also may need a change of scenery, like um, Alex Holtz in New Jersey, or Oliver Wallstrom in New York with the Islanders could be in that category. So there's a lot of options. But uh, Verbeek had said he wants a top six, like, right winger who will fit his play style uh, or what, his vision for the team. So I'm not sure if any of those names do it for him, but um, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Actually one that I kind of remembered while you were um, talking about a couple of those guys is Dakota Joshua with Vancouver. I mean, Verbeek today, he was, he's talking about how um, playoff teams, they get great production from their bottom six when they need it. It's not just the top six and, Dakota Joshua has shown that this season he had 18 goals and he scored against the Ducks a couple of weeks ago when they played in Vancouver and he scored two goals in game one of the playoffs. And obviously on a bigger stage in the playoffs, like contributions like that get mag or get magnified so much. And he's going to be a UFA this summer and he's probably going to get 
a lot more than Vancouver is potentially willing to pay. And um, he's, he's a big body too. He's, I think he's six, two and he's really physical. He gets into the dirty areas. That's something that the ducks were kind of missing, especially once Adam Henry got traded to Edmonton. I think Henry had six tip goals and the next highest was McTavish, I think with three. And so if they can get someone like that, who's not just big and gets to the net, but he also has a little bit of skill as well. I think that would be a really great addition. I think that's very interesting uh, how you pointed out a guy who gets to the net and gets tips because I think that's a big thing the Ducks were lacking aside from Kalorn and Vetrano of late. I think the Ducks have been uh, generating offense more from the perimeter um, and making skill plays, but at, but they're going to need at some point to get to the dirty areas, get in front of goalies, battle in front, and get puck get uh, sticks on pucks because even though McTavish can get into areas like that, I think that's something an aspect of his game he needs to work on. Um only problem with Joshua is that he's lefty. Uh and yeah. I was I thought it was interesting that for be specified right shot. And um so I don't know, maybe he'll he'll budge off that, but we'll see. Um I don't think I have anything else. Maybe, uh, nah, never mind. <laughs> Just a lot of speculation on my end. Um, we can move on. This next one is from P underscore Rod 29. And he asked, what progression are you looking for next season from the core at Young Ducks individually? So guys like Bill Carlson, Trevor Zegers, Mason McTavish, Pavel Minchikov, Owen Zellweger, et cetera. Yeah, so with the first four names you mentioned, just stay healthy. Yeah. It's a big yeah. thing. Uh, uh, we were talking to Cam Fowler uh, yesterday, and he was saying that you kind of just have to experience the rigors and of daily life and L- an eighty-two game season, and um, that you just got you got to have to just go through it and take your lumps. But as far as progression, I mean, individual for each of those guys, Carlson. Carlson, I think, needs to work like just finish. I think he creates so many chances um, just with his like he's way more dynamic than we ever gave him credit for before this season. He is so he's way faster, way he's got way better edges. His skill is elite. His shot is really good and smart. Um, but I think he needs to work in a little bit in the faceoff dot, a little bit in coverage and just finishing. Zegris um, needs Zegris needs to stay healthy and continue to evolve his defensive game. He made a lot of big strides, in my opinion, and in a lot of uh, opinions around the Ducks' sphere um, this season. Defensively, being clever and utilizing some of the things that make him great offensively, translating that to the defensive end of the ice. Um, things like you know his stick work and how he anticipates plays. McTavish stay out of the box. <laughs> That's an easy one. <laughs> um uh Minchikov. Minchikov, I think, can get a little more powerful in his stride. Um, he has a little bit of a shorter stride and and he's uh I think he can I think he can get to pucks a little quicker and that'll help him uh avoid the the hits and and uh maybe buckle down in front of the net a little bit. Zellweger, I thought Zellweger just throughout the year made a lot of strides. Um, both ends of the ice. Uh, I just think you kind of just got to let him loose. <laughs> but the kid is so dedicated and so willing to learn. He's a student, and and we've seen his work ethic. He's always the last one off the ice at practice by a good 15 minutes at least. Mm-hmm. So just just keep 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 doing stuff like that, and and he'll be fine. What do you think? Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head on a lot of these guys, especially like I, I told this to one of my friends at the beginning of the year. It's like when you see Connor Bedard, all the things he was doing in the preseason, he's doing all these amazing moves. He's getting through the defenses and then he'd get to the goalie and he would kind of fluffed the shot or he wouldn't put it in the spot that he really wanted to. And I told him, I, I told my friend, I said, once he gets the finishing down and he, he knows how to beat NHL goalies, he's going to be so dangerous. And he figured it out in like two weeks. And yeah. so I think if Leo can figure that out, he'll be a much more dangerous guy. And I think it's kind of the same with 
Zegris is they're really similar in that they both look for the pass a lot. And so if you have the shot to kind of be that dual threat, you can make sure that guys aren't really playing off you and, oh, he's going to, he's going to pass the puck. If you have that shot to kind of make sure that they don't cheat one way or another, especially for the goalie too, if the goalie doesn't know if you're going to shoot or pass the puck, they can't really um, commit to one side or the other. And I think Trevor Zegers had a really great play in that last game they played against the Kings is he had the option or not, not the last game, but the one at Honda center, he had the option with Ryan Strom to pass it and he shot it and it was a really nice shot. So I think if Leo can add that to his game, he'll be a much more dangerous player. Um, McTavish, the same to stay out of the box. I think he said he wanted to work on his skating a little bit. I think that's a fair assessment. That's something that even going back to last year with Dallas Eakins, he, that's something that he said that they really wanted to work on with McTavish. So just making sure he's a, a little bit quicker on his edges and being, being more strong, stronger on the puck, um, especially because of how big he is at such a young age. Um, same thing with Mintikov. I think there were times where it felt like he probably could have gotten to the quick, the puck a little bit quicker. Um, he definitely has the agility and the edges to do that kind of th that thing. Um, and then for Zellwer, I think um, some of the concerns are just kind of like his gaps when he's um, defending the rush, especially because he's been playing on his offside. It's a, it's a little bit different than playing on your strong side. So I think that's just something that you kind of have to learn on the fly mm -hmm. as you play more and more, like Cam said. So, um, And then um, I think you can add like someone like Lugas Jostal to that too. He's part of that younger core. Um, for him, I think it's just getting more games and he talked about that too as well the most games he's ever played as a professional and um, getting that be, being able to play regularly as a goaltender is something that you kind of enjoy and being able to get back at it one game after the other so um, just continuing to build on those performances when he gets those chances yes agreed okay moving on this is from ducks keys how many of the pending RFAs do you see getting signed? So quick recap. Uh, current pending RFAs are Isaac Lundestrom, who has a $1.8 million qualifying offer. Uh, Max Jones, who has a $1.5 million qualifying offer. Brett Leeson, Bo Gruel, um, Gustav Lindstrom, Yurovac Anainen, and Jackson Lacombe, all under a $1 million qualifying offers. Of those guys, uh, Verbeek didn't really show his cards but gut instinct what do you think i mean my gut instinct is jackson lacombe is probably the only one coming back um i mean you can make an argument for some of them i think if you wanted to bring back like say jones lundestrom lisa that's a pretty solid fourth line i think max jones has really shown flashes especially this season that he can be a capable like fourth line kind of guy um but he just Again, like a lot of the Ducks couldn't stay healthy. Um, I think Lundestrom is a solid option as a defensive forward, but nothing more than that. I mean, his offensive IQ is really limited. Um, we've talked about it before. Is he, He'll come down on the rush and he'll hoop around the net, and then that's it. Like there's no threat that's created from it. He kind of just cycles it back to the point, and then like that entry was kind of wasted a little bit. Brett Leeson, though, I think out of – all the other RFAs, I think he probably has the best chance at coming back. Uh, he's been up and down the lineup throughout the season, and he's shown that he can make plays and he can score and get points on the board when he's put in those positions. Um, I think it's just a matter of doing it on a consistent basis, and uh, I think that's something that Greg Cronin kind of wanted to see from him too is he was just really inconsistent when it came to uh, performing at the top level. Uh, as yeah, um, I think Luke Holmes a no brainer. Um, and then I think Gustav Lindstrom has a good shot just because Verbeek had made a, had made a point today of saying, or he just wants a right shot. But if you look at the ducks depth chart, it's Gudis and it's a lot of uncertainty, whether that's Tristan Leno, who, um, we'll probably get to later, but, um, there's no guarantee he'll make the opening night roster or, um, have a big role and drew Hellison and we don't know what the organization feels about him. Um, he's already 23 years old. 
So I think Gustav Lindstrom has a good shot, maybe. But I wouldn't I wouldn't put my mortgage on it. <laughs> and then Max Jones, like you said, he's shown flashes. I thought he took a lot of he took a lot of steps this year in his um in his poise and his offensive IQ, in my opinion. I thought he was looking for a lot of play like a lot more uh plays and not just trying to barrel to the front of the net or or go all out on the forecheck but he was trying to be a lot more cerebral so i liked his progression 1.5 isn't too steep of a qualifying offer and i know a lot of the players in the room enjoy him uh having his presence around but uh, i mean all the other guys i and i don't have high hopes for uh coming back unfortunately yep i would agree with that all right. The next question we have is from Brian S. Lind one, and he said, please give an update on the two Russian reserve players, please, which I would assume is Artyom Galimov and Vyacheslav Butietz, a uh, forward and a goaltender, both playing in Russia. Uh, Pat Verbeek actually said um, in an interview with Aaron Cooney uh, from the San Diego Goals that Butietz will be in San Diego next year whether he's actually in San Diego or he ends up playing for Tulsa in the ECHL, that remains to be seen, but I would expect him to get signed at some point during the summer. Uh, Galimov, I, I mean, there's not really much to write home about for Galimov. Uh, he had that really good uh, world junior tournament, I think a couple of years ago, it's not even a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019. So that's five years ago now, but um, he's been playing in Russia. Uh, he's still playing for Kazan Bars. Um, but he hasn't really become much of a scorer. I think he's kind of just more of a checking forward. I uh, typically play as a little third and fourth line from what I've seen. Um, and honestly, like if I'm Gallimov, there's no reason for me to come over to the United States. Like if you can continue to play for a Russian team in the Russian league, you don't have to go anywhere and you, you get paid, then by all means, like, I, I would just want to stay at home and, not really have to do anything. Yeah, I have nothing to add there. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to at Validus29. Odds of a Gibson trade and Dostal being the number one moving forward. Also assume they'd bring in a vet on a cheap deal to mentor him at that point. Um, I don't like... It's so weird because people have talked about there being a trade or a potential trade for John Gibson for however many years, and he's still here. And and that's not to make it sound like, oh, he's still here, you know, <laughs> because John Gibson is still a capable goaltender. Like we've seen that he can still make good saves. He's still capable of being a starting goaltender, even if Lukas Dostal is kind of knocking on the door. Um I, I, I don't know. I It's really weird to talk about like trades like that because there's not really an option when it comes to goaltenders unless you can find a specific or a team that specifically needs one and they're willing to pay for it. And because of also the contract that Gibson has, he has 6.4 million for three more years. There's not a lot of teams that are willing to absorb that number, especially when we've seen a lot of teams bring in tandems like the golden the vegas golden knights they have aiden hill and logan thompson or even the boston bruins they have jeremy swayman and Linus olmark like a lot of teams aren't really committing to that star goalie long term anymore obviously there's teams like the winnipeg jets who have connor hellebuck and igor shesterkin in new york and well not even um sorry um wow i can't remember his name but the one <laughs> for the islanders Sorokin. Sorokin, Igor Sorokin. I was <laughs> going to say that he is the number one, but he's not because Semyon Varlamov is now the starter and for the Islanders. So we, we're seeing a lot more teams move towards those tandems and not necessarily looking for that number one that they want to give big money to. So um, lots of a Gibson trade. I'm just, I'll just put it at 50 50 because, you know, like we could record this and like a month from now, they're like, oh, well, John Gibson got traded to so-and-so. But I, I would fully anticipate him being a part of the Anaheim Ducks come September. Um, I think 
Luke Ostostal having that full season now under his belt and playing as many games as he did, um, it gives them a good idea of what it's like to be a starting netminder in the NHL. And if they can continue to push each other like Pat Verbeek has uh, discussed today, then that's beneficial for everybody involved because whoever's playing better will get to play more games and that creates that internal competition, which is kind of what you want is everyone pushing themselves to be the best that they can. Yeah. And I think when you, sorry, when you, uh, when you look at incentive to move Gibson, the ducks aren't again, they're not a cap team. They're not even close. His $6.4 million is, isn't, hurting them in that aspect whatsoever they're not you know limited in, in their moves so for a team to to acquire his services they'd have to make it worth for beaks while basically so they'd have to give up assets they're probably not willing to give up for a goalie who you know from uh traditional statistics or um, more analytical ones hasn't had a good season in a while but it's clear the talent's there. And I think it's probably beneficial for the team and Dostal himself to see this through, to be a true 50-50 tandem and ride the hot hand. Um, and it, it probably could be good for Gibson as well because in previous seasons, the a big reason why Gibson's numbers haven't been so good is because... Uh, Every night he's playing 60 games and he's playing the Oilers and the Leafs and Avalanche Panthers. Like he's playing the tougher opponents while the backup's playing the lesser opponent. So his numbers aren't going to be as good in front of a team that was and is as bad as the Ducks are have been in the last however many years. I hope that made sense. <laughs> All right. The next one we have is from Anaheim Ducks underscore FR, Anaheim Ducks France. Any chances to keep these beauties for good? And of course, they're referring to the 30th anniversary jerseys. I I have no thoughts because that's not something I'm really plugged into. They're a lot, but I will admit they're a lot better in person than I thought they were going to look initially when they were first revealed. I, I don't really know what the Ducks plans are for, like going forward. I know people have talked about a rumored rebrand and whatnot, but I, I can't really see them doing anything with that until OC Vibe, or at least the early stages of OC Vibe, are kind of locked down and they have something kind of in place. There's a lot of construction going on right now. So I think until they at least have some kind of formations up and you can start going to things at OC Vibe, I don't think they plan on doing anything in terms of the jerseys aside from having what we've seen in typical non-anniversary seasons. Yeah, I think those jerseys were a one-off. They were they were nice, and it's nice to see those colors again. Um, but yeah, I think a rebrand or potential rebrand, I think you're right, ties into the OC vibe. Like so many things we saw, you know, Gary Bettman come to Anaheim well, like a month or two ago and said, you know, they're looking at an all-star game or a draft in Anaheim, but not until the OC vibe is complete and functional. So I feel like that's a big, that's a big goal. That's a big date or the franchise moving forward. And yeah, like you said, I don't see a rebrand coming until then, but I mean, you walk around Honda center, you walk around any team facility and, you know, you see a lot of, you see a lot of mighty ducks attire and a lot of eggplant and plum. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, plum and Jade. Um, <laughs> all yeah. right. Um, uh, moving on, uh, Ducks de Pressau asks any of the Gulls players who could step up next season. This is a tough one because I mean, I, you you look at the guys that came up this season, Nikita Nesterenko and Pavel Regenda. Um, those are potentially two guys that could have an impact. Regenda is a restricted free agent though. So it's unknown if he's going to come back or not. Um, but Nesterenko, I think definitely it should be, someone that's looked at as maybe having a crack at the lineup next year in a bottom six role. I think he, he played pretty well in the handful of games that he got. Of course, he got sent back down when Sam Colangelo was officially signed. Um, but I think there's still potentially a place for him. It also, like we talked about earlier, it depends on 
which of the RFAs come back and even unrestricted free agents too, right? Like Ben Myers is a grade six UFA instead of a restricted free agent because of the amount of games he played. Um, and then also Drew Hellison, like you kind of touched on, that's somebody that could potentially have an opening just because of the dearth of right-handed options on the blue line. Um, aside from that, it's there's not really that much in terms of guys I think are NHL ready yet. Like you want guys like Nathan Gaucher and uh, maybe Tyson Hines, guys like that. You want them to be potentially ready for the NHL in like a year or two. Um, or even someone like Jed Caulfield, I think, kind of flies under the radar. He's he's a big guy. He has a really nice skating for somebody um, of his size, though. I think those are guys that you can maybe look at in a year or two as being ready for the NHL. Someone like Braden Tracy, I think, is you can look at, but he's also a restricted free agent, um, and he hasn't quite developed at the rate that the Ducks would have hoped for um, in the same way that Jacob Pro, who's traded at the deadline, was so maybe someone like the guy that was he was traded for in Jan Mishak that that's a guy who could potentially be um, a bottom six guy but again uh, a lot of the guys that played for the goals this season I don't think are necessarily NHL ready Sasha Pastorjov is another one of those guys um, so but the good news is that the Ducks don't really need any of those guys to kind of step up right because they have a lot of those young core pieces at the NHL level already. Yeah, I think the one guy I circled is Drew Hellison. Just because, like you said, the the lack of right shot defensemen currently on the roster. But I will say Sasha Pas- Sasha Pasajov had a pretty decent finish to the year. Uh there was a stretch, I think he got hurt and there was a stretch where he was pretty absent on the score sheet, but finished with like I don't know, it looks like 14 points in 18 games or something like that. And and seems like he kind of figured his way around the AHL, um, which, it, you know, is he's he's a guy who doesn't have a ton of physical, like dominating skills, six foot, 183 pounds, doesn't skate very well, but he's a very smart player and he can get to, like he can take the puck from the wall to the middle and, and get a shot off and is very effective at it and he's got good vision. So that's a guy I'm interested to monitor. And if he has a good first half of the year, maybe next year we'll see him in Anaheim, but I wouldn't put money on it. And that's the only forward really I would I would even consider um making an impact at the NHL level at least. Well yeah, this one from Crossy66 Paul asked, how is Luno's recovery going? Um Tristan oh, yeah. Luno, he had a staff infection, or that's at least that's what we believe because that's what was reported by the French media. Um, and I, I don't really have any reason to doubt Renaud Lavoie, who's a really uh, plugged in French reporter, but uh, Tristan Leno, he had a staph infection when he got to work, or I think he was, he got sick and then he ended up getting a staph infection when he went to world juniors. And that basically knocked him out for like the rest of the season. Like he just started skating again last week. And so that's really tough being being off for that long and not doing anything at all um i think that's a really tough go uh thankfully he has the whole summer to kind of get his strength back and um hopefully get some of that weight that he lost back on him um and yeah other than that i mean there's not really a lot to um kind of divulge about that uh the ducks have been pretty quiet about that as well i mean i've seen Lino around a couple times um and he says he's he's doing fine so um it's, it's just nice to see that like it wasn't something that led to something even worse. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how that's going. Yeah. It's nice to see him without any sort of anything on his knee and uh, you know, finally skating. So it seems like he's at full health and now, yeah, like you said, it's just about getting back into to game shape. Okay, I'm going to move on to a draft question. This one's from Matt Nelson, 88. Uh, will you two be covering the lottery and subsequently the draft? Can, can you believe some people have Hellenius top five? That's a shot at me. Um, well, yes, we will be covering the draft, uh, first of all. Um, we're hoping that we can get both of us there. Uh, it's going to be in Las Vegas at the Sphere, I believe. So that will be exciting. Um, in terms of... Consta Hellenius finished prospect going top five. I mean, I will admit my draft coverage has been very, very 
sparse to this point. I usually just wait until, or I mean, just because of the last two years, waiting until the Ducks kind of know where their position is in the lottery, um, I think helps nail it a lot, nail it down a lot more for me. So I'll kind of hand this one off to you. Well, yeah, I'm really hoping we can both be at the sphere. But um, as far as, uh, you know, the the options, it's like Celebrini and then it's this big gap or this big tier of like tier two is, you know, eight to 12 players deep. And it's basically just a preference game at that point. Do you, is it, do you be drafting for need? Do you want a right shot defenseman? Do you want uh a two-way center in your system like and just what what you feel translates the best to the nhl so i like constellaneous he's no, my number three just because he's done so well at the finish uh in the finnish liga and you know he's uh, just one of the smarter players in the draft and i think his skill set will translate but i'm sure we'll have a lot of draft questions as we get closer to that and i want to end on um a, a big talking point this off season in the last week has been about the Ducks captaincy. So uh, at SSYJRR asks, uh, who do you think is most likely to wear the C next? And if uh, there's going to be an announcement in the near future? Well, uh, we spoke to Pat Verbeek today and he said he would like to have a captain in place this summer. Um, it's really tough to say who is most likely, I think there's a batch of candidates. I mean, who knows, like maybe the potential captain isn't even on the roster right now, but I think um, from the list of internal candidates, I think there's a, um, a couple of guys you could go with. You could go with Troy Terry or Mason McTavish, Radko Gudis, Alex Kalorin. Those There's two young guys in there, two veteran guys in there. I think all four of them bring a, kind of a different element to the kind of leadership that um, the team is looking for. As for most likely, I, I don't even, I really don't know. It's, it's, it's really tough to say. I think I probably would have had a different answer um, ahead of last season when it was kind of between McTavish and Terry, but now I'm not really sure. I will say three guys were asked um, yesterday during exit interviews about potential growing leadership roles and what they're, you know, what they saw them, how they saw themselves in the locker room. Fowler, McTavish, and Terry. I thought Terry had the most interesting answer where he it's he likes to challenge himself in that aspect. He wants to be more vocal, I believe. And he and he but he reads and listens to podcasts about leadership. And that's something that he's always done at every stage in his career and something that he wants to translate to the NHL level. So, you know, based on their answers. I would say Terry at this point is the leader of the clubhouse, in my opinion. But uh, I believe Verbeek did say that. Uh, did he say uh, expect an answer this summer? Yes, he, he said yeah. that they want to appoint a captain this summer, which I would also agree with. But we also we had a lot of questions, um, but we don't have enough time to get to all of them today. So we will have a written piece on the rest of them, and uh, you can expect to see that sometime in the near future. So thanks for watching.